We honour your holy name and Lord we pray that you continue to work in our lives through your word and through your spirit. Father we pray for this nation, we pray for this land, that you send an outpouring of your spirit. We pray that you direct the hearts of those who lead and guide this nation. Lord, we ask you to be glorified. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon every church and chapel, Lord, that proclaims the gospel in the cities. Lord, send revivals to our cities and to our countrysides and to our valleys. Lord, will you move in such a way that people encounter you. Lord, you are a supernatural God who breaks into our lives. So, Lord, break into this village and have your way, we pray. And may we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> so, Olivia, Olivia, <coughs> come and share with us. It says, being confident of this, 
It soon begins a good work in you, will carry it on the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And God has taught me one thing from this. Once you're his, you're his. And you may stray, but you're never too far away. When we will give your life to Christ, there will be hardships. And we're not promised to need you walk. In fact, we are told it's best to be treated as Jesus is treated. Um, but we will not go through it alone. Um, just like the sermon that we did this morning, fight a good fight and run the race that's set for you. So that one day, the imperishable crown of righteousness can be fixed from the earth. always good to hear people's testimonies and how they come to faith and how they grow in the Lord Jesus because it is a living relationship that we have with Christ. He does become our, our best friend. He is our saviour. He is always there when needed and he is a prayer away. If you don't know the Lord Jesus then do ask him to come into your life. And a couple readings this, this afternoon as we turn to God's Word. So I'd like to read a few verses from, from Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And then we, we read here. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. <coughs> and his sons would go and feast in their houses each of his appointed day and would send and invite their sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the day of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered to the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has, on every side, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possession have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 16, we, verse 15 we read, of chapter 16, But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And also, I say to you that you are Peter, 
And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. May God add a blessing to the reading of his precious word. How do we begin here? What do we see? We see here that Jesus and his disciples are at Caesarea Philippi. And he's in this dialogue, this conversation with, with Peter, asking Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? And stop, I didn't even have this. the Son of the Living God. And the incredible thing was, Jesus' Heavenly Father had revealed this to Peter. You are the Christ. Christ if you, if, means anointed one, Messiah. So Peter has this revelation. They're there at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus has asked Peter, who am I? He says, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the anointed one. And then Jesus goes on to say to Peter, you know, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In this context and where they're to, the gates of Hades shall not prevail Caesar and Philippi, this is the location where the god Pan was worshipped. There's like a bit of a cave and a nice watery area there. And the locals, the Greeks, would go down there and they would worship this deity, this Pan goddess, which is kind of like a satire. Which um, you kind of see the satire then, it crop, he crops up back there in the book of Isaiah. As you look into the Hebrew, he skips and dances in deserted locations. But anyway, here we have Peter confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, at a location where the God Pan is worshipped. And then Jesus is saying to Peter, Gates of hell, what gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will build my church. And God is building his church around the world. And the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. And God would use Peter to go out and, and to preach and see thousands come to faith. Like on the day of Pentecost when Peter is preaching. And so this insight is given to Peter by revelation from God the Father in a pagan location. It could almost be like thinking of it. Turning up at Stonehenge on the summer solstice a couple of days ago. And, and, and who is Jesus? Well, Jesus, he is the Christ. He's not the Son God. He's not the God of the Son. But my Jesus will build his church. It sh that's the kind of impact it would have had as the disciples heard that. And then when we look back there in the book of Job, we discover this area in which we have to be very careful because it's an area of, of spiritual warfare. Is an area of, of spiritual conflict. Because God has created this world. He has created the physical world, the tangible, which we see all around us. He has also created a spiritual world that we do not see. We, we don't see the angels worshipping and glorifying God. 
that are probably around us and joining in with worship here. We're seeing here in Job that there is a spiritual realm as well as the physical. Even the Apostle Paul, there in Ephesians 6, is referring to us, reveals to us about a spiritual battle that is going on. And the thing that I find interesting is, when I look at Job, Job's alright. He is a good man. He is praying for his family. He's like a, like, a, like a priest almost of his family. And in case his children have sinned, he makes an offering for them so that they can be right with the Lord. When we look at Job's character. He, he's pure. He's holy. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of his word. He is a man who lived out his life in the fear of the Lord, in respect to God. Nobody could make an accusation and say, Job, that, this is what you're doing wrong. Nobody could point the finger at Job. He was a good and an upright man. In verses 2 to 4, we see what Job had. We see what he owed. Amazingly, he was wealthy. He was like super rich. He was blessed of the Lord. He had a large family. His blessings are here. I mean, I don't know, what's he got? 3,000 camels. You ever tried to put 3,000 camels on your front lawn? You know, we'd have them all over the mountain. So we would have had the land rights to go with all this and with the sheep and with the donkeys. In verses 5 to 6, Job, he served his family as a priest. He loved his children. He prayed for them. He offers sacrifices and temporarily atones for their sins. Job was committed to the Lord. He was. And in Job 6, Job was consistent. He was not a part-time believer. He was like, oh, I, don't, I believe on Sunday, but Monday I'm going to live how I want. No, he lived seven days a week, 24 hours a day, before the living God. He lived out his faith day by day. Every day was spent walking in a way that was pleasing to God. He tries to avoid sin. He seeks God for others. He's living in a relationship with the Lord. Things are good. And Job's character, you know, is, is, is beautiful here. He's living a life for, for God. His character is right. The way that he views life the way he wants to put others before himself. He cares for his family, cares for his wife, cares for his friends. But then something happens. We see the spiritual curtain is drawn back. We have a glimpse into heaven where in the courtroom of the Lord, You've suddenly got Satan there, in the courtroom. And, and the audacity, I just find the audacity of this. The Holy God Almighty allows this scandal, sca scandal uh, the, the, this Satan, into his very presence. The one whom the Bible calls the dragon. Apollyon, Belzebub, the Lord of the Flies, the Father of Lies, the Antichrist. This is an evil spirit, also known as Abaddon. And he's there, trying, if you like, to get, to get at Job. Saying, Job's only following you, God, because you put a hedge of protection around him. That is the only reason why. 
And God's like, I remove my hedge of protection. Job is still going to follow me. Job has a relationship with God through the good times and through the bad times. Job knows his God intimately. It's like a love relationship between the two. And the curtain gets drawn back and we see this good man, Job, comes under the spiritual attack where he loses everything. You know, even his wife is saying, curse God and die. I mean, he's in a real difficult situation. And we know good things can, can, can happen. Uh, bad things can happen to good people. We know that, that sometimes because of our own sin, we have consequences that we have to own up to and admit. And I was listening to somebody the other day who, who I, I met a couple times and he was saying about his son. His son goes off to Paris, Paris does a degree in engineering. And he's a lovely kid, he's a lovely kid, he really is. And then he meets this girl, they end up sleeping with one another, he wakes up, he looks at the, the mirror in the bathroom, and it says, welcome to the AIDS club. The first person he slept with, he contacted, contract, he had AIDS from her. It broke him. He comes back to faith, he goes on with the Lord. He, he got right with, with God. And sometimes things happen when we deliberately say. I, got, I know I've, I've had other friends, you know, their son jumps in the car, goes for a drive, and a drunk driver comes, hits the car, kills the son outright. Their son had done nothing wrong, but it was the sin of somebody else. That, that, that caused the tragedy to happen. And here we have Job. He loses his family. He loses his house. He loses his livestock. He loses everything that he has. He even be, be, becomes... Uh, what's the word? Disease. That's a good word. He becomes diseased himself. And yet he still does not curse God. And, and Job doesn't know that Satan is attacking him and bringing all these things into his life. He's not aware of that. All Job is doing is just keeping his focus on Yahweh, on his God. Keeping a walk with him. Keeping a relationship with him. When Peter is at Caesar Philippi, they're at the entrance there, they're near far from that, that, that place where Pan is worshipped. Jesus says, Who am I? You are the Christ, you're the anointed one. God breaking in with his revelation into a spiritually dark area. Peter did not know what was going on. And yet God breaks in. And Peter gets, if you like, the revelation because he's kept his focus on Christ. He's not looking at the shrines to Pan. He's not looking at that worship. He is focused on Christ. And the revelation comes. Job comes through this great loss of losing everything. And at the end, he begins to understand and God begins to restore everything that was taken from him. This is our God. Our God breaks in. We, we focus on the Word. We seek God through His Word. We pray and we seek God. We don't see everything that's going on around us. And yet, in his perfect timing, God breaks in. Because the gates of Hades 
shall not prevail against <coughs> my kingdom. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. If you are in Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you were placed into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and you belong to Him. Do you belong to Christ this morning? This afternoon, there will be trials. There will be difficulties. I mean, even look at the Lord Jesus Christ. If, you know, He gets baptised. He's doing what's right. He's baptised as an example for us. And then we discover He's in the wilderness. Satan is tempting Him. And again, the spiritual curtain is rolled back and we have a glimpse and we see what is going on. Satan was tempting Jesus and if Jesus had fallen into sin, at that point in the wilderness, Jesus would never have gone to the cross to die for our sins because only the perfect Saviour could go to the cross and die for us. This is Jesus. A perfect saviour who works in an imperfect world, who takes imperfect people and begins to transform them, begins to do a work in them that he will complete. And when you step then into the glory, into heaven, you will step into heaven perfectly perfect. Perfectly perfect before a holy God. And they will rejoice. And a lot of the stuff that we've gone through, that the, the attack, if you like, from, from the evil one and from the enemy, that we may not have even noticed because we've kept our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father has given us the revelation and the insight in how to live for him to bring him glory in difficult situations. You know, Zechariah 13, 9 says, I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. Can we say that? The Lord is our God. Peter went through difficulties. Job superly went through difficulties. He comes through. He's an example for us. And if you are, I'll be honest now, lightning hits the tallest tree. Right? If you are pursuing the Lord, guess who's going to try and stop you? Yep, it's the diablos. The devil will try and stop you from following the Lord. He'll say, you don't need to pray. You don't need to read your Bible. You don't need to meet together. He will try to stop you from going deeper with the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that happens to us, it all gets worked out for God's glory. And we often don't see the full picture when we're in it. But there comes a point when we can look back and say, yes, God was working in that. And we can also say, I am in this season of my life just for a season. And God it, it is bringing me through. Okay, just checking that there's no deacons here. But one of the way oh there is one. Sorry. <laughs> Cover your ears, Anne. See, one of the sometimes I, I, I okay, I struggle sometimes with deacons meeting. I'm not a detailed person, okay? I'm not a an organizer. I'm not an administrator. I really do not have that gift. I see the big picture and I just want to go for it. And I have lovely people like Anne comes along and says, 
Yeah, but the details. We need the details. And that, uh, but it all work out. It all work out, you know. I mean, when we start, so we've been here what about a month? It's taken about what three, two years to get to this point. And I didn't know you had that charity commission. You had to have lawyers involved with the property and all this technical stuff. I just prayed about it. God says do it. This great man gives me the keys to the building. Let's start. But now we've got to get the building safe and policies and all that sort of stuff that I just don't get. But anyway, what am I saying is, yes, we're in certain things will happen just for a season. <coughs> So sometimes the way I survive a deacon's meeting is <laughs> in a good way. It's a good way out. I love deacon's meetings, really. The, the way I survive is I think to myself, this will only last for an hour or three. <laughs> it will only last for two or three hours. And then I can do something that I enjoy. The blessings come. Right? When we're going through troubles for a season, we're in it for a season, but then we come through and the blessings come. Job couldn't quite see those blessings coming until he got through and then God broke him. Peter at Caesarea Philippi couldn't see that blessing coming of the revelation of who Christ is from God the Father into his heart and into his mind, but it came. It's the same with us. You might be in work tomorrow thinking, I don't want to be here. But it's only until 4 o'clock. <laughs> only until 6 o'clock. And then I can do what I enjoy. So, but what I'm getting at, God is in it. He's in the details. And he's always speaking, always breaking in, doing something new. So may God continue to work amongst us for his glory and to build his church here and in our prayer times may we be aware that there is an enemy that wants to stop us from following the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Amen. In the house of the Lord. 
You are my love. 